wonderful staff in this mega program. Bruno will start next on community engaged prayer. Um, I want to begin with uh, three epigraphs. The first, well known, is drawn from Martin Engels in the German ideology. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The second <coughs> is from Mao's critique of Stalin, the economic problem of socialism in the U.S. Star. Communism cannot be reached unless there is a communist movement. And finally, there are the graffiti that I saw or imagine having seen on some bathroom door here in Burbank College. Don't ask, what would Jesus do? Ask, what would Jesus do? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, the meaning of these statements will become clear as we go. Um, I will divide this uh, three parts. The first is called, Did Somebody Say Left Wing Communism? In 1920, Lenin wrote a well-known pamphlet in which he denounced what he called leftism or left-wing communism as an infantile disorder of a fully comprehensive and mature communism. More than 40 years later, in 1968, the brothers Danny the Red and, and Gabriel Convendit would turn the diagnostic around by announcing tongue-in-cheek that another specter, the specter of leftism, was now roaming the streets of Europe, this time as a remedy for the senile disorder of communism. Today, another 40-some years later, what are we to make of this inversion in the midst of the global economic crisis and the never-ending wars of terror upon terror? Should we revert to Lenin's orthodox denunciation of the leftist disorder in favor of a return to the original idea of communism, however much we may want to deconstruct, retreat, or weaken this idea today so as to soften the blow of orthodoxy? Or should we add our voice to expand on the pain of leftism as the only idea that will save us from the sort of failure of really existing communism, that is the communism of the Soviet Union and the worldwide fate of the official communist party, now almost all bankrupt, extinct, or buried under the mystification of a new name, cleansed of every compromising trait of Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism, Stalinism, or Mao? Can we as a group, and by this I mean not just the speakers at this conference, but comrades and critics in the audience, and outside the narrow confines of this academic enclave, can we even come to an agreement about the need to separate the communist hypothesis from the history and theory of leftism? Furthermore, is communism named the effective history of we, as Alain Bazou wrote a decade ago in Up an Obscure Disaster? And it's according to the same account of the death of communism after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, there is no longer a we. There hasn't been for a long time. Is there hope that beginning with meetings such as this one, it might become possible once again, albeit on a modest scale, to speak as we, or even as we communists? That is to say, following a slightly different path, is now perhaps a good occasion to release the gesture that brought together Felix Guattari and Tony Negri more than two decades ago when they were communists like us, or communists like us. <laughs> in the mainstream media, all such communist talk is easily dismissed and cast aside as yet another case of ultra-leftism, or l'extrême gauche as the mirror image of l'extrême droite, one of those items out of a cabinet of political curiosity usually restricted to academics, though now, ironically, seen as threatening enough so as to warrant public rebuttals in the press, if not, as is also happening ever more frequently under our very own <coughs> eyes, violent repression by the police and military state apparatus. <coughs> Does not then the attempt to demarcate the communist hypothesis from various forms of leftism <coughs> fall in line with this tried formula by which ideologues of the status quo time and again seem to keep at arm's length, the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. In fact, is not the accusation of leftism or ultra-leftism, together with the related critique of mere reformism, responsible for some of the worst kinds of sectarianism and international strife within communist circles. Even among participants of this conference, 
as many of you are no doubt painfully aware, the leftist epithet has been thrown around with surprising ease and insouciance. There are, after all, notorious contradictions in the midst of the people. My intention in regard to these contradictions is not to aggravate them by throwing salt in open or freshly healed wounds, but rather to clarify attention and render them explicit so as to avoid finding relief in the quick fix of a superficial consensus. This is, after all, how Marx, in one of his letters to Arnold Ruger, defines our task, namely, as self-clarification, critical philosophy, to begin, by the present time, of this struggle and desire. And Marx continues, this is a work for the world and for us. It can only be the work of united forces. It is a matter of a confession and nothing more. But, you know, Jesus will like this Christian image. In order to secure remission of his sins, Marx writes, Marx writes, mankind has only to declare them for what they actually are. Unlike Marx, however, Lenin prefers a medical over a theological image. Left-wing communism for him is not a sin so much as a disease to be diagnosed on the basis of a set of recurring symptoms and cured or treated with the appropriate, uh, or eradicated with the appropriate treatment. In fact, insofar as leftism is described as a childhood disease, in the era prior to mass vaccinations of the dose against measles or rubella, which are now also in question as, as responsible for autism, it may very well be beneficial for communists like us to catch the disease at least once while we're still young. <laughs> the ailment involves no danger of leninism, and after it, the organism even becomes more robust. In addition to this clinical history, the notion of childishness and sometimes of puerility also comes to be diagnosed in moral and pedagogical terms, with leftism revealing a dangerous lack of maturity combined with an impatient desire to skip the intermediate stages in the gradual process of growth and development by leading all at once to the highest state of coming. Here, Lenin uses an analogy that should be the lighting of the Platonist in Badiou. To attempt in practice today to anticipate this future result of a fully developed, fully stabilized and constituted, fully comprehensive and mature communism would be like trying to teach higher mathematics to a child of truth. In the era of self-anointed pedagogues, pedagogues and super nannies, we might say that leftists in this sense are communists with an extension deficit disorder. <laughs> in which case the remedy by necessity requires great deal of all-around training and guidance. For example, in the unions or syndicates, which, as Marx already writes in Communist Manifesto, constitutes the school of socialism. All clinical and pedagogical rhetoric aside, Lenin's efforts at defining the phenomena should be familiar enough. Leftism or left-wing communism, for him, involves a principled stance against all participation in parliamentary or bourgeois electoral politics in trade unions, and even or especially in party discipline. The upshot of this repudiation of all compromise is a doctrinal repetition of the truth of pure communism, reduced to a frenzied, incendiary, and semi-anarchist type of radicalism, a clamorous appeal to the direct action of the masses over and against the organizational structure of the party, unions, and party. Subjective impatience in a, in a characteristic oscillation between exuberance and dejection does take the place of the arduous and persistent work of organization. Refugiation of the party principle and of party discipline, that is what the opposition has arrived at, Lenin concludes. It is then only logical that in order to overcome the leftist strength, Lenin would roll out what he calls the ABC of Marxism, according to which masses are divided into classes, Classes are usually led by parties, and parties are run by more or less stable groups of their most influential and experienced members called leaders. All this is elementary, Lenin writes, adding the bite of sarcasm to the repertoire of his teacherly mode. Why replace all this with some kind of written role, some new vola hoop? Now, Lenin was obviously not neither the first nor the last to hurl abuse against some form or other of leftism. Marx and Engels before him already struggled 
with the uncompromising radicalism, for example, of the blonde coming art. After Lenin, on the other hand, the battle, the battle against twin deviations of left-wing adventures and right-wing opportunism was also to define the stakes of ideological struggle in Maoist China before spreading to the various Maoisms worldwide, particularly <coughs> during and right after the Cultural Revolution. We are also opposed to left phrase mongering. Mao had famously written in non practice the thinking of leftists outstrips a given state of development of the objective process. Some regard their fantasies as truth, while others strain to realize in the present an ideal which can only be realized in the future. They alienate themselves from the current practice of the majority of the people and from the realities of the day and show themselves adventurous in their actions. Now, as indicated in the title of the book by the brothers Kohn Van Dijk, leftism would also undergo a dramatic reversal of roles precisely around the late 60s and with special force in so-called philosophy toward the mid-70s, in part as a perverse and unexpected consequence of the Maoist struggle on two fronts. In fact, the leftist hypothesis, what I'm calling the leftist hypothesis, from this moment onward becomes so dominant, not to say consensual, that in order to define radical deviations from its correct line, new emphasis come to be coined, such as ultra leftism or pseudo leftism. The first of these labels, the one of ultra leftism, by the way, is often used, I think, by one of the mill liberals or conservatives to at least serve up the illusion that they too, in a sense, are nice and shiny armor coming to the rescue of some genuine form of leftism, because they at least not fall in the trap of ultra leftism. Two, on the two sources of contemporary leftism, with the inversion of Lenin's indictment, the leftist hypothesis over the past few decades can be said to have taken two basic forms. Both of these could be illustrated and frequently find support in respectable quotes from the Orthodox canon. And in this sense, they remain anchored in the history of Marxism, which is even the reason why they sometimes claim to embody the genuine movement of communism. As Lenin writes in pamphlet, the surest way of discrediting and damaging a new political and not only political idea is to reduce it to absurdity on the plea of defending it. The first great figure of leftism involves a purification of the central Marxist idea of contradiction, reduced to a direct, unmediated, and often explicitly anti dialectical opposition, such as that of the masses against the state. Especially among French so called new philosophers, almost all of them ex-communist and more specifically ex-Maoist renegades, the purification of the Marxist contradiction is often phrased in terms of the old academies of the state and the police. From the Communist Manifesto we know of course that our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, if that is still our epoch, has simplified class antagonism. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other. But now this split or scission, Balkan, almost in a Lacanian sense that these ex Maoists would jump on, no longer opposes the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but rather in an equally heroic but ultimately inoperative face to face confrontation, the formless masses against the excessive form of the state modeled upon the generalized image of the gulag. Politics, even when labeled the class struggle, then perennially opposes the same vitally creative masses to the same deadly repressive system. In this regard, as Badiou remarked in his theory of contradiction, the massive ideology that came out of 1968 excelled in flattening out the dialectical analysis always the same exalted masses against the identical power, the invariable system, despite the system. Not only does this view of politics fail to take into account how no movement proceeds except by the split that may dislocate it from within, but what is more, far from signaling a radically new discovery, the fascination with its mass figure as an extreme form of generic communism was already a prime target of urgent attacks 
more than a century ago, a century and a half ago, in 